Welcome to today's video. I hope you got a chance to watch those two interviews I did with uh, Deutsche Welle TV. They're good fun to do those, but you're just so rushed and a bit pressurised. So it, they are good fun to do, but they're actually quite hard work. And it's much better. I much prefer it when it's just you and me sitting having a chat. And we don't have that pressure from outside. A bit about the UK today. A problem that's been identified in the UK that I think is a problem everywhere. So I think we can all learn from that. And then keeping it fairly brief today, a really encouraging story from Finland about sniffer dogs. So uh, stick around for that. But we're going to start with the quiz. Um, this was a um, recorded in Mumbai a few days ago. Um, and the quiz is, uh, can you see any reasons why COVID-19 might spread in these conditions? I do apologise for making light of that. It's a serious matter, but I've actually travelled on those trains and it is just an incredible experience. So some people do it every day for years and years. And uh, when I was there, I pretty soon learned to avoid the, the, the rush hours if you possibly can. Now, um, but it, it does show a serious problem, um, the, the, the overcrowding in India, the crowded conditions that we've talked about many times in terms of living conditions, but there we see in terms of uh, commuting conditions as well. Now, um, these are the cases the last three days in the UK. We see the numbers are becoming relatively high. These are the deaths for the last three days, yesterday, the day before, the day before. So deaths are starting to creep up. And we can also see the data on hospitalizations. Now, hospitalizations are still relatively low so these are the figures for the UK as a whole. Now, this is, this is the peak here, of course, uh, back in April. But we do see a bit of a pickup, unfortunately, here in terms of the uh, hospitalizations. So that's daily and cumulative numbers of COVID-19 patients admitted to hospital. And this is patients actually in hospital, again, UK total. So the total we see at the moment is, according to this, uh, 1,330. 30 patients. United Kingdom patients in hospital, seven day average 1,351. Um, in terms of, but again, we see massively lower than the peak. And in terms of critical care capacity, again, these terrible days back here, but now we are seeing an increase and uh, we're what? Uh, 181 critical care beds at the moment occupied by uh, COVID-19 patients. So there's no question that it's increasing. I mean, cases are increasing more dramatically in Spain and uh, France, less dramatically in Italy, less dramatically in, in Germany. But we've got a definite increase here in the UK and, and the trajectory is bad. The trend is unfortunately up, even although the numbers at the, time, the present time are relatively small. Now, just to reinforce that a little bit, th these are the... Um, these are the, the Our World in Data graphics. So this is the linear scale. So this was the peak of the pandemic here. And we now see that the number of cases, daily cases, appears to be higher than the number of cases then. But of course, the number of cases back in April, uh, March, April, May, were greatly underdiagnosed. And we've argued on previous videos on here that there was about 50 times more actual cases. So when we've got four or five thousand new cases per day at the height of the pandemic in March, April in the UK, the real numbers were probably nearer 200,000. Whereas these numbers that we have now, the number of new cases now are much more accurate, reasonably, reasonably accurate. Um, I'm not saying these are the exact numbers. They're always an underestimate. But um, but that, that graph is misleading. That that The number of cases we have now is nowhere near the number of cases we had at the peak of the pandemic due to massive underdiagnosis at this stage, early stage of the pandemic. And we see that the deaths thankfully look fairly low here, although we do see a slight pickup. 
But then when we look at that on the log scale to get a bit more detail, we do see that they are starting to increase, unfortunately. And uh, we know that they are going to continue to increase for some days because of the lag effect. Now, moving on to the lesson that I wanted us to learn from the UK. Now, there's different protocols, different parts of the world, of course. But this data here, this study here is adherence to test and trace and isolate system. Is it working? Now, the mob that carried this out are a fairly reputable bunch, largely paid for by the National Institute of Health Research, Public Health England, largely carried out by King's College London University of East Anglia. So very reputable academics, no question about that. So a reasonable, reasonably looking study. Now, the background here, and you, you know this already. I mean, surely everyone knows this off by heart now. It's been done so many times and we're so far into this pandemic. We all know this, don't we? Um, let's look at it. Need for people with a persistent uh, new onset cough, fever, loss of their sense of smell or taste too. And we could add to that great fatigue as well. So they need to, of course, remain at home for at least seven days from the onset of their symptoms and self-isolate themselves until at least, we would say, 24 hours after the symptoms have resolved for a minimum of seven days. Remember, a minimum of seven days. Uh, they should request an antigen test, of course, and uh, they should provide details of their close contacts to a dedicated service if their test result is positive. This is the basis. So the recognition of the features. And these factors here are the basis of the test trace isolate system. This is how it works. It can't work without that. And of course, most people should know these details now. Uh, close contacts of people who have tested positive for COVID-19 to remain at home for 14 days from the time of contact as well. So that's the, the other criteria. So they're the criteria that everyone should know about now. But the question is, of course, do they? And the answer is no, they don't from the data that we have. Let's let's look at it. It really is quite staggering, this data. Survey of over 42,000 individuals over the age of 16. Right, identify any of the key features of COVID-19. So did people know that the key features of COVID-19 are cough, high temperature, fever, loss of tense, uh, taste of smell? Well, about half of the people in the country know that one or more of these is an indication that COVID-19 may be present. So as of the study period, the 2nd of March to the 5th of August, hopefully it's better now, but of that study period, less than half of the people in the country recognized those clinical features. Not a good start. Self-reported adherence to self-isolation if symptomatic. So who self-isolated for the seven days or until features resolved? Well, 18.2% did that. The others didn't. Quite incredible. Uh, who requested an antigen test if symptomatic? Well, 11.9% of people did that. So like 80% of people didn't do that. Nearly 90% of people didn't do that. Intention to share details of close contacts. Well, most wanted to do that. So what they found in this study was that the intentions were good, but when people self-disclose these facts in confidence, only about a fifth of them were um, self-isolating and a, a, almost one in 10 were, were requesting an antigen test. This was just not being done. So there... Just under half knew there, 18.2% did the right thing. 11.9% did the right thing. The rest didn't. 76.1% uh, had good intentions. And um, self-reported adherence to quarantine if alerted that you have been contacted with a COVID-19 case. 10.9% did the right thing. So about 90% didn't. Quite stunning results the ignorance was surprising but even when people knew what to do most of them were not doing it so you can have the best test trace and isolate system in the whole wide world but if people are not complying as they are not 
then that explains why we've got ongoing spread. People are not complying with this. This is what the data shows. They are not complying. And if that's the same in the UK, I strongly suspect it's the same in most other countries of the world. This is a major problem. People are simply not complying. None adherence with associated with. Men were the worst. Younger age groups were worse. Having a dependent child in the household made it worse. Lower social economic grade made it worse. Greater hardship during the pandemic. If people had a hard time, that made it worse. Working in a key sector made it worse. That is unbelievable because these are the very people that are going to go out and spread it. I was really, really taken aback at that one. And yet that is what the data shows. Conclusions. Practical support and financial reimbursement is likely to improve adherence. Targeting measures to these particular groups that are not complying. So we've given figures for how, how many people were contacted on test, trace, isolate. But basically, that's utterly irrelevant if people aren't going to do it. And the data shows that they are simply not doing it. And I would add, add another criteria to that. I would say we all need to work together um, to make sure that people are helping each other to do this. Um, now, let's uh, look at a good news story. COVID sniffer dogs, E.T., Cossie. Mima and uh, Valo, <laughs> these dogs. Um, <clears throat> this this study is involving uh, this lady here, who's at the University of Helsinki. He's the, he's the scientist responsible. Four dogs currently working at Helsinki Airport, state-funded pilot scheme. Uh, this lady here in charge of it, Anna said, if this works, it could prove a good screening method for other places. Sounds good. Because basically, basically it turns out that dogs are remarkably good at sniffing COVID-19 once they're trained up to five days before people get symptoms. Absolutely amazing. Why aren't we using more dogs? They're much more accurate according to this data than our tests, much more accurate. Um, so if it works, we could see screening method all over the place, good. So, um, so for example, you could have sniffer dogs uh, outside a pub, outside a restaurant, outside a football ground, outside a theatre, sniffing everyone who goes in and uh, barking or pawing or whatever the dogs, different dogs do different things depending on their individual personalities, but indicating clearly to their owners and managers, their handlers, that someone is infected with COVID-19. There is no ambiguity about it. This could be done and this could mean that society is completely reopened up. You know, if you have a restaurant and everyone who, before everyone goes in that restaurant, if they've been sniffed and they haven't got COVID-19, remember if the dogs can detect it like three, four, five days before someone becomes symptomatic, the viral load at that point will be so low that the person should not be infectious. People are probably only infectious in the 48, more likely to be the 24 hours before symptoms begin. And yet the dogs can sniff them way before that. Why don't governments realise this is a potential complete game changer in the pandemic? I don't know. Why are we going for these expensive pharmacological based testing when we could train dogs up to, to monitor everyone going into a theatre? Then everyone going into the theatre would have a pretty good idea if the dog hasn't sniffed or poured or barked at them after having sniffed at them that they were, they were negative. Um, why isn't this being done? And, and dogs can sniff other diseases and sense epilepsy and all sorts of things. Why is it not being done more? It really is one of those imponderables that just don't seem to make any sense. Um, I suppose um, it doesn't make the scientists look particularly clever uh, by inventing clever tests. It doesn't make big pharmaceutical companies huge amounts of money. It just makes human beings more humble by realising that there's uh, things that dogs can do absolutely brilliantly that we can't do at all. So I don't know why it's not being done. After dogs indicate infection, PCR tests could were, were, are carried out. So they still do, do the testing. The dogs are nearly 100% accurate. So the dogs actually are as accurate, if not more accurate than the testing. 
That's what they're finding in, uh, in, in Helsinki in this, in this trial. Now, the dogs are being tried in other places as well, but it's, they're just not coming. We just, we, we just, it's just not happening. We just don't see it. People talk about it. They realise it works, but nothing's happening. Uh, dogs can also identify COVID-19 from much smaller samples than the PCR test. This amazed me because the PCR test is so sensitive. But wait for this. Dogs can sniff between 10 and 100 molecules to detect the presence of the virus. That is just simply mind-blowing. What they're doing at Helsinki Airport is the um, the initial trials that were used in armpit to sweat. But I would imagine using um, underarm deodorants is a problem there. It could, it could kind of overpower the, the, the smell and the dog might get a bit confused with that. But this is just taking samples of sweat from the surface of the body. Putting on a swab and the dog's, the dog's indicate if, it's COVID, if the person's COVID-19 positive. So it could be three, four days before the person develops symptoms, the dog knows. Absolutely amazing. And there is another study there that, uh, that, uh, that backs that up with a bit more, bit more science. Now, um, I think I'll show you one more video from uh, India that I've been sent. Monkeys can be a big problem in India. They'll come in and pinch anything. So let's just look at a COVID hospital here that's been affected by monkeys. Yeah, well, thank you for sending that video in. And I've forgotten who's done that. I'll get the name and give it to you tomorrow. But um, it's great that people are sending me this source video. And I've had problems with monkeys in India myself. They're scallywags. Uh, they'll steal food and they can be a bit aggressive as well. So, And let's close with uh, Marina, who's a long-term viewer from uh, Austria. So thank you, uh, Marina, for watching. I believe you've been watching all the way through, actually. The people that have been watching all the way through, uh, you absolutely deserve a medal for sticking with me for all that time. OK, shortish video today, but some important points, some important points there. Why the heck aren't we using dogs? And also rats. Rats are very good disease sniffers and can be trained almost, in fact, I think as effectively as dogs. So why aren't we using rats and dogs, especially dogs, and because they can just run in between the, between the crowds and sniff people. So why aren't we using more dogs? And is it any surprise we've got spread when we see the, uh, the crowding in places like India and uh, the fact that people are just not recognising the need for isolation and are not complying? The data is showing people are not complying with test, trace and uh, isolate. So it makes a bit of a mockery of the of the whole thing, really. Well, one other apology. I did, I did say in one of the recent videos that the UK only introduced its smartphone app yesterday. That's not true. That's not true. Northern Ireland introduced it ages ago. Scotland introduced it a few weeks ago. It was England that only introduced it yesterday. So it's behind the times, but glad um, it's out now. I've downloaded it. Of course, I would encourage you to to do so and thank you for watching this video as always.